challenge that you're going to run into when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus is Jesus. Because it's easy to be a Christian when you're the one deciding who or what a Christian is. <laughs> and it all sounds good. There's theology to help you decide, you know, what kind of Christian you are. There's hermeneutic and homiletic to discern how you're going to be a Christian. There's your idealism, you know, and your mores and your situational ethics that's going to determine when you're going to be a Christian. But the one place you really can't call yourself a Christian is when you're talking to Jesus, because frankly, He's the only Christian there ever was, and I don't find too many that are like him. Now, I do know that in history there were lots that were close to him, that followed him and had become his disciples, but you see, they had a different standard in those days for being a Christian than we have now. Now it's a matter of, oh, well, we're forgiven, and by grace, you know, we're given this propitiation for our sins so that we can now call ourselves Christian and go on with life and do our thing. But Jesus brought to himself all the people and his disciples and gathered them together up on a mountaintop and then he told them what a Christian would be like. Unfortunately, nowadays we interpret that into something it never was in those days. We try to make it fit somehow an easier method than the requirements of our acting out and becoming more like Jesus than less like ourselves because it's a whole lot easier to tell someone, well, you know, he didn't mean love your enemies, he meant like them. You know, when Jesus was talking, you know, on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, you've heard it said that, you know, you shall, you know, hate your enemies, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. For everyone that smites you on the right cheek, you know, turn to him the other. And if any man will sue you, give away your cloak also. He didn't mean that literal. That was extremism to make a point. He was trying to make a point. He was trying to give an example, not to actually do it. Of course, he did say, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. Of course, he said, judge not and be not judged. But, you know, we can judge because for with what measure you judge, you shall be judged. So we can get away with that. And he said, if your eye be evil, you know, then your whole body is evil. But, you know, the thing I always find interesting is that whenever everybody explains to me what the Sermon on the Mount doesn't mean, I always ask them one last question after they tell me what it doesn't mean. Because... If we're reading it and it means what it says and says what it means according to the Bible, then I would think that Jesus was being literal, don't you? But, you know, I let people tell me their explanation, and I'll admit that I come from churches that still, to this day, will tell you that the Sermon on the Mount is the idea of what you're going to be like in the kingdom. Of course, then I get to... Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. But he also said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name? And every one that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Interesting. Here Jesus is warning people about which way you should live your life. Should you build it upon a rock by doing the sayings of his? Or should you build it upon sand by not doing them? You see, if you interpret them, you're not doing them, are you? That's the problem with being a disciple. You can call yourself a Christian and be a follower. You could call yourself a Christian and be distant. You could call yourself a Christian and be theological. You could call yourself a Christian and be religious. But when you want to be a disciple, you come face to face with reality check. And there's some people that... Many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> Why do I feel like I got the wrong... wrong scripture? Hmm.
Praise the Lord. I did have the wrong scripture, and I was just now opening it up to look and see, and I went, wow, well, this fits too. So whenever we're being challenged by God, he's not wanting to push us away, but he's saying, look, many are called, but few are chosen, and to be chosen, all you need to do is ask. Ask God to change and rearrange you. Ask God to develop you. Ask God to make you into what he wants you to be as opposed to what you are. Because what you are is distant. You are a sinner saved by grace. And you're very distant. You're a follower as long as you see the miracles and you feel good. And you go to church and you get these little buzz-ons you know, from worship. And you get the little earbuds you know, and you can kind of hype yourself up. But what happens with the reality of what Jesus said when you've got your enemy in your face and he's smacking you around? Where are you at on that? Do you have the measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ in your life that the Holy Spirit has filled you with love for that person and compassion that you could take a hit, a blow, a death, a suffering? Do you think so? Well, good. Maybe you're a disciple because now what happens when suddenly you're caught in a position where you see your children being attacked? Do you think that the reality of Jesus being born and all the children around him being slaughtered won't happen to you? Uh-oh. Do you think because they came and killed Jesus and then killed his disciples and slaughtered 300 years worth of Christians regularly, it won't happen to you? Well, I'm not that kind of Christian. You're right. You're not that kind of Christian. So if you want to be a disciple, you need to sit down and count the cost. You need to measure for yourself whether you want to go all the way or halfway. Because you see, a Christian is going to go all the way. They will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of his testimony, and loving not their lives even unto death. I hope you discover that as you grow. Because as you go through this book that we're discipling on, and as you're becoming a disciple of Jesus, that you're giving your utmost, all that you have for him, you're going to discover that it's going to cost you more than you think. It's not said utmost for just an adjective phrase. Utmost means it's going to require every single thing you've got inside. That it's going to tear your guts apart. It's going to put your wife, your children, and your life on the back burners. And it's going to say to you right now, Am I going to walk with God? Am I going to talk with God? Am I going to do God's will? Will I be an Abraham to my generation? Will I be a Paul? Will I be a Peter? The afterwards of the life of power. Whither I go, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. John 13, 36. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Three years before, Jesus had said, follow me, and Peter had followed easily. Fascination of Jesus was upon him, and he did not need the Holy Spirit to help him to do it. Then he came to the place where he denied Jesus, and his heart broke. Then he received the Holy Spirit, and now Jesus says again, follow me. There is no figure in front now saving the Lord Jesus Christ. The first follow me had nothing mystical in it. It was an external following. Now it is a following in internal martyrdom. Between the times Peter had denied Jesus with oaths and curses, he had come to the end of himself and all his self-sufficiency. There was not one strand of himself he would ever rely upon again, and in his destitution he was in a fit condition to receive an impartation from the risen Lord. He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. No matter what changes God has wrought in you, never rely upon them. Build only on a person, that person being the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord himself. And on the Spirit of God that he gives to you as you depend upon him and not your own understanding. All our vows and resolutions end in denial because we have no power to carry them out. When we have come to the end of ourselves, not in imagination, but really, we are able to receive the Holy Spirit after we have reached the end of our rope. Receiving the Holy Ghost, the idea is that of inv invasion. There is only one lodestar in the life now, and that is to follow the Lord Jesus in everything and in every way that he directs us. 
because we can make up excuses like the Sermon on the Mount. We can make up all the different reasons that we don't do what God tells us to do. But the bottom line of what God wants to do in us is to cause us to come to the same place that he did when in the Garden of Gethsemane he cried out and threw himself upon the rock and looked to the heavens and said, God, if it be possible that I could pass this cup by without drinking it, then let it be done, for nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. So will you choose this day whom you will serve, or will you go away sorrowful like the rich young ruler, because you're not willing to give up your wealth, your health, your children, your wife, your will, your religion. Because that's where we're at today. All Christians know what to do. They really do. They know they need to read the Bible, and they don't. They know they need to pray, and they don't. They know they need to do this, they don't. They do what feels good at the time. It feels good on Sunday to go to church. It feels good on Monday to do what? Watch football? It feels good to make it a Christian endeavor if we are a Christian football team or a Christian basketball team. But where is the cost to you personally? Where is the obedience to you individually that you can tell me God spoke to you and said, I want you to go and do this. That is when you become a disciple.